Hello, good morning, and welcome to Elevens is with Fran. This morning's story is called The Proof, and it was written by Mary Rickwood in 1954. And you guys, I'm gonna need you to tell me afterwards what you think it's about. <laughs> is it about loss or loneliness or identity? missed connections, holidays. It's a really kind of mysterious, lovely story. It's on the longer side, so, you know, get ready, settle in. Um, one of you told me you were gonna listen while doing your tax returns, which I choose to take as a huge compliment. So, um, I really think this is a lovely story, even, even if I can't really understand it. Um, so let me know afterwards what you think. Settle in, you got your cup of tea? You got your piece of cake. Thank you all so much for joining. This story by Mary Whitwood um, won a national short story competition in 1954 um, and then was never reprinted until Persephone did it recently in the second Persephone book of short stories. So it really, um, really disappeared without trace um, until Persephone brought it back to light, back into the, to the open. Okay, you ready? Settle down. <laughs> it makes it sound like, it's, like I'm teaching in the class. Settle down. Now, settled in with your cup of tea and your piece of cake. All right, great. This is The Proof by Mary Rickwood, written in 1954. The afternoon was over at the Faraday School for Girls and Miss Galley sat waiting for her class to go. Beyond the windows hung the huge autumn sky blackening orange like a great screen that would soon soak up darkness from the ground. In its rich, burnt light, the room's electric light bulbs hung yellow and solid as fruit, and the room was full of voices and laughter like the crackling of small fires. Miss Galley sat at her desk, impenetrable and still, a long, thin figure, extravagantly awkward and plain even in repose, with the obstinate ugliness of a creature out of its element like a pelican on land. Her mud-brown hair bent in an unbroken arc around her brows, fantastically tufted at each side on a level with the tops of her ears. All her face cowered behind the great T-shaped mass of forehead and nose, set with small deep grey eyes and a broad crescent mouth such as snowmen have. It was a face of bold lines so intolerant of each other as to produce at first sight the kind of incredulity which is defeated even as it rises by amazed acceptance. The small eyes and the timid mouth remained suspended there to be recognised day after day, though it could only seem that features so arbitrarily selected might at any time, ran might at, any time at random reassemble into a different pattern. But while they remained, they imposed upon Miss Galley the greatest difficulty in making any communication by means of them. Her smile was famous, and though she smiled often, it seemed always the outcome of an intense struggle. One could fancy a remote, muted groaning of long disused machinery, which strained the elements of her face for a quick moment into a new face, and fell back as the two trembling points of a scrimp spring will leap apart when released. Miss Galley had never studied her face and had never herself felt the, felt the astonished interest in it which kept her classes silent and absorbed, even when their minds were wholly unreceptive of the mathematics which she was teaching. It was accepted by the girls of the Faraday School that there was, as they put it, something about old Galley, nothing that could be learned in terms of mathematics or of her attendance at school parties, something even to be accepted as undiscoverable, and celebrated now for years in the ironic name given her by an editress of the school magazine, The Proof. One by one now, the desk lids closed and the girls came up out of the heat of painted radiators and the acrid smoke of chalk and ink and paper to say goodnight to Miss Galley. Good night, Miss Galley. Have a nice half turn, Miss Galley. One after the other, extinguished in the dark corridor outside. As the flushed and gilded faces vanished, Miss Galley felt, as she always did on such occasions, grateful and confused, even ashamed, and wondered if she should perhaps ask just one of them some unexpected question to repay an interest or curious curiosity the light, glancing kindness of their voices. But even as she thought of it, it seemed to her so impossible an intrusion that, for the moment, she felt despairingly that even the simplest words upon which, if upon any she could rely, had slipped her memory, leaving her speechless. 
The spring of her smile wound tighter and tighter in compensation until the last girl had gone. And when Miss Galley switched off the lights in her room, the sky was dark beyond the windows. She went quickly out into the corridor, a flat, narrow figure, long-armed, walking with a clumsy sway, as though she were uncertain of her steps down the flagged passage. In fact, she loved the stone corridor, descending at intervals in three worn steps, and she moved in it as in the peaceful fields of numbers at home. She wrapped it about her and walked slowly, savouring it. In the staff room, she had learned that she was known as The Proof, and she had often felt a certain gratitude for the settled identity it seemed to bestow upon her. That of a long flowing shape, substantially correct, yet full of surprising errors. But on this November walk afternoon, walking more slowly than usual, less willing than ever to leave the corridor, she was troubled. In less than three hours, she would be on a train, not merely for half term like everyone else, but for extra days of holiday, forcibly given to her by the headmistress. Swaying down the corridor, Miss Galley tried to, tried to recall the interview. Miss Clodden, widowed early and with the son now at Cambridge, was proud of her achievement and her headship of the Faraday School for Girls. She forthrightly expected, and for the most part received, a simple recognition from her staff of the importance of her judgments upon them. Miss Clodden liked dependence, or resistance which she could correct, and she was irritated by Miss Galley, upon whom she could never feel that any guiding incision had been made. Miss Galley could teach mathematics, but her inability to make use of any suggestion put to her seemed to Miss Clodden an impenetrable obstinacy. She is a weak spot, socially a weak spot, Miss Clodden would say to her deputy head and stir her coffee broodingly, stretching out her broad legs to the fire. She had been more exasperated than usual at the interview with Miss Galley, but she had spoken calmly and, she felt, generously, in urging Miss Galley to take a few extra days holiday. Forget us completely for a whole week, she had said vibrantly. Try to see something else. You will come back to us feeling so much broader and fuller and you will be so much more useful to us. Broad and full, Miss Clodden felt herself to be as she showed Miss Galley out. So Miss Galley, charged with this heavy duty, went slowly down the corridor and collected her heavy overcoat. She swayed sadly out into the rich, damp evening, sludging her feet over the leafy drive and went home to her sister, Claire. <clears throat> Everything is packed and I booked your room with Tower House. They're expecting you tonight, Claire said. You've just time to eat and then I'll run you to the station in the car. Oh, Dora, do look alive. A gentle despair, damp and mild as the evening, settled over Miss Galley. Fragments of her smile appeared and vanished and her sentences hardly struggled beyond. But Claire, until with a final effort, as she got into the car, she made what might have been her last communication on this earth. Claire, I don't think I know how to look alive. And I'm not overworked, you know. Why don't you go instead? Claire, placidly driving, did not trouble to answer until she swung the car gratingly into the station yard. She came round to face her sister, standing by the side of the car and smiled brilliantly into Dora's face. The clear smile finite as a frame picture, which Dora remembered Claire always to have had. And Claire said, I should be angry if I were not certain that you were going on that train in four minutes. You're a bore, Dora. Go and enjoy yourself. You do like the sea. Oh, yes, said Miss Galley, as though confessing to an inescapable vice. But, and it was only when the train made its first hesitant move that the sentence completed itself. But Claire, I'm and Miss Galley blurted it out with the force of a, re of a revelation. I'm very happy at home. Oh, then go and be unhappy for a change, Claire said, her exasperated laughter drifting with the steam over the yellow station light. And Miss Galley was carried off to the sea. Miss Galley could hear the sea as soon as she left the train, like someone quietly breathing in a vast dark room. And as she went down the lane to the tower house, she grew happier again, as she had done all her life whenever she had lain awake in bed at night, with every, everything in the room breathed upon by the gentle, inexorable darkness, and as she would feel, gone perhaps forever. 
Miss Gurley was so reassured that she scarcely noticed the warmth and the pink light of the tower house when she arrived, or the two small, brisk ladies who received her in her bag, or the cocoa they gave her, or the waiting bed. Her serenity was only briefly startled by their last words, you'll meet everyone tomorrow, before she fell asleep. But the morning forced itself upon Miss Galley, fierce and brilliant. The unfamiliar, bright, coloured room seemed to be poised around her, still trembling from the sudden leap into place it had taken just before she'd opened her eyes. And even before she left her bed, she had begun an anxious inventory of her surroundings, her senses agitated and struggling to be alert. Of course, Claire and Mrs Clodin were right. She didn't notice things enough, though Miss Galley fancied she heard her own voice making these admissions and was far too agitated to do more than hope that their missing was clear to Claire and to Miss Clodin. She found the dining room already almost full, with a concentration in it of milky light poured in from the flat silver-pointed sea outside the windows. Little plumes of steam rose from teacups, ming mingling with the medicinal fragrance of food for the invalids, who were becoming broader and fuller in the care of the Mrs Arkwright. Bright and competent as birds, the Mrs Arkwright moved among the tables, taking Miss Galley with them. This is our guest who came in the night, they sang, and every table Miss Galley was welcomed, little plumes of voices now steaming up about her. She heard herself recommended to hop by carb every time if you've a stomach, Voices gave her the latest news, almost as far as the golf course yesterday, of their gentle rivalry. And now, Mr Stanmore, said the younger Miss Arkwright, here's somebody who looks like a walker. I really think you'll have to defend your title. Miss Galley nodded in stupefaction to the dark and silent man who sat in the furthest corner of the room, his hollow face so cold and pale that the clear light seemed to turn back from him and rushed the more gladly to every other object in the room. Miss Arkwright drew Miss Galley onto her appointed table, calling gaily backwards, We're keeping you waiting, Mr Stanmore, even for your poor scraps. He's an ulcer, she said quickly to Miss Galley, who was then dropped like a sack into her chair. <laughs> Miss Galley went out each day along the disintegrating cliffs and would stop often to stare with earnest concentration at their spongy whiteness, streaked with violent black, orange and dull yellow. Across them, the slow, heavy shadow of a gull would pause and plunge, solider and dark than the bird itself, dazzled in light over the sea. Miss Galley had come here often as a child, and she felt sure that Claire, if only she were here now, would be able to find all the lost scenes that Miss Galley could not remember, briskly sifting the sand and the broken pieces of rocks into their old patterns, as she might search in an untidy cupboard for things which Dora felt were lost. Father was often here. Miss Galley heard, bounding back from the soft cliffs, her father's loud, rueful laugh. Will never make sense to Dora, to think I should have a daughter who only thinks in numbers. Miss Galley frowned and wondered helplessly if father had minded. Mr Stanmore and Miss Galley caught sight of each other several times in the first two days. He would see her standing oblivious and concentrated before the cliffs, and his exasperated spirit would sometimes make him desire to prod the figure with his stick. He saw Miss Galley three times a day in the dining room at the tower house, but he could never see her without astonishment. And after another day, the increasing irritation of his health and thoughts did at last cause him to prod, prod her as she sat in the afternoon on a low rock staring across the bay to the last point where the cliffs seemed finally to fall into the quiet sea. Enjoying yourself, he called out as he came towards her. And as if it had been Claire who asked, Miss Galley hastily reassured him, rising, oh, ye yes, and went on after a slight hesitation. I was trying to admire the view. Do you find it difficult? asked Mr Stanmore. Miss Galley found this so much a question she had asked herself in the last few days that she could even smile before she replied. Yes, I do. I don't easily notice things. I don't remember them. I don't get enough out of my... Uh, I don't get enough out of life, my sister says. Miss Galley added this last because she found it impossible to take the responsibility for having reached this conclusion herself. Mr Stanmore had a feeling that this was a conversation he had meant to begin long ago, and he felt instantly anxious not to delay any longer. 
At that moment, it seemed to him obvious that he should say, in return for what Miss Galley had said to him, Miss Galley, I am very unhappy indeed. And he said this with a truculent force behind which he could record his own astonishment at the inexpressive sentence he had uttered. Miss Galley looked at him soberly. I wish I could be too, she said. They sat until it was almost dark, while Mr Stanmore pleaded with the immobile figure on the rock to recognise how he could no longer go on teaching history as he had done with increasing sorrow for many years. There are too many things, too many people, Miss Galley, and one knows too much about the past and nothing about the present. He took pleasure in repeating her name, as though he were pleading with an obstinate jury. He wheeled round exactly face to face with her and shouted, Miss Galley, I'm supposed to go back soon and it simply can't be done. And Miss Galley, helpless and ashamed, feared that he would add, what are you going to do about it? Mr Stanmore became silent as they walked back to the tower house until they were almost there, when he burst out with an agony of rage and irritation. Have you thought, Miss Galley, what you are doing on this earth at this time? Have you, have you ever thought what your piece of the pattern is going to look like afterwards? No, never, said Miss Galley sorrowfully. And feeling that she had disappointed him, but wishing to do what she could, she added with great effort, but I should think it would fit in somehow. I hope so. The prospect of an eternity of oddness dismayed her. Mr Stanmore only nodded, looked quickly at her, and when they reached the house, went up to his room without a word. Miss Galley was never again so articulate as on that first afternoon, except perhaps on the windy evening two days later, when she stopped during their walk and turned at bay, facing Mr Stanmore's, Stanmore's words, which beat upon her like the clouded sea against the cliffs. I can't manage words, you know, only numbers. Mr Stanmore's uproarious, sour laugh flew off into the wind and she felt that he had agreed to let her remain silent forever. On the last afternoon before her return to school, she sat with Mr Stanmore at the window in his corner of the dining room, with spread fans of rain dashing against the panes and falling down the glass, when the gusts ebbed like showers of slow stars from a firework. Miss Galley, said Mr Stanmore, I had decided to give up facts but you are one more for which I am most grateful. There is always one more, said Miss Galley simply, as she had often said in mathematics lesson. I shall be able to go back all right, Miss Galley. You are a fable for our time, like the moth who cared nothing for candle flames and spent a long life looking at a star. Miss Galley felt the recess recessions of language to be, to be more than ever beyond her reach. And Mr Stanmore himself could not but sense a certain inappropriateness of comparison. He felt, however, compensated in being, able, in being able to end, who flies afar from the sphere of our sorrow is here today and here tomorrow. He retained his last sight of Miss Galley in every detail, fixed in the clear light of that incredulity which had come upon him whenever he saw that gaunt head, this time attached to shoulders and a long arm over the lowered window of a railway carriage a hand in a yellow string glove with overlong fingers, like a clown's hand, waving a jerky and amiable farewell. You guys, what does it all mean? And yet I love it, even though I don't really know what it all means. What do you think? Loss, loneliness, I think loneliness. We're all alone with no excuses. It's sort of something about that, right? Um, let me know in the comments what you think. I'd be really interested to hear. Um, so Mary Rickwood, the writer of that, she wrote that short story and then she wrote one novel and that was it. Disappeared from literary life without trace, which is sad. In fact, um, uh, when I uh, posted about this on Instagram, there was no tag anywhere that said Mary Rickwood. So there you go, Mary Rickwood. Not big on Instagram, turns out, who knew? She knew, she definitely knew. Um, so I hope you enjoyed that slightly longer story today. Hope you got lots done, whether it was staring at the clouds or doing the washing up or finishing your tax returns or whatever it might be. 
Thank you so much for joining Elevenses with Fran. It was really, really lovely to have you today on this slightly grey rainy day where I am. Um, yeah, thanks for joining and I will see you soon.